So, uh, good morning, everyone. Reactive programming lessons learned, or should I rather say, you have to be this tall to practice reactive programming. And if you came here to have some practical advice, how to configure thread pools, how to make your reactive system have such and such throughput, this is not going to be talk about it. But before we start, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction, who am I? So I actually built quite a few complex reactive systems. I'm not really proud about the complex part. So I was maintaining ACA clusters with more than 1,000 remote nodes that were doing some really fancy risk analysis for investment banks. Um, I managed to run tens, hundreds of thousands of requests per second on a single node, using all of this using reactive programming. And it wouldn't be possible with, without reactive programming. So that's, that's, that's an important lesson learned here. I also beat C10K problem and C100K problem with plain Java and reactive programming. We had some amazing talks yesterday about Netty. And you know that this is, not, uh, this is not it. You can go even further. Wouldn't be possible without reactive programming. I also wrote a book which has reactive in its title. So I kind of know a little bit of this stuff. And most importantly, I read a lot of high scalability. So I'm not going to lie. I will be a bit grumpy in, in this talk because I want to show you like a little bit darker side of reactive programming. I want to show you some of my experiences. And most importantly, I want to show you that you don't need reactive programming most of the time. OK, so let's start. Do you know this Chinese saying? It's actually a Chinese curse. It says, may you live in interesting times. The point is, no one wants to live in interesting times. Interesting times means wars, revolutions, destabilization. Everything that can, everything that can possibly go wrong goes wrong. No one wants to live in interesting times, unless you are a revolutionist or someone like that. So I'm going to change this saying a little bit. May you support interesting code base. And it sounds positive, right? But when someone looks at your code and says, wow, it's interesting, you sort of feel that there's, there's, there must be something wrong with it. Probably today's interesting is tomorrow's WTF. Someone looks at it and, yeah, you use this strategy pattern using partial function application in an interesting way. It's not a good thing. No one wants to support interesting code base. We want code bases that are really pure, that do not have any interesting facts. But what does it mean, interesting? We'll get into that a little bit later. So let me give you a very, very simple user story. It's not like trivial. It's, a, it's very simple. Just a, a similar, similar thing that guys yesterday did uh, during the last talk, which I'm kind of extending here. So fetching user from a database, calling a web service, doing this and that, a little bit of calculation, and then storing something or sending an email, whatever. Now, you don't really need a user story, because if you look at the implementation, in virtually any language, if you're a Java developer, C-sharp developer, uh, Scala, Swift, Kotlin, whatever, it pretty much looks the same thing. You can understand it even if you have some issues with the actual syntax. I mean, do something with this data, start in a database, if statement, for loop, Probably the stream API in Java is the most fancy thing you can find here. The thing is that there's virtually no other way of implementing this piece of code. Maybe you could use a for loop instead of for each loop. This is the simplest piece of code you could ever find, and it expresses the business logic perfectly. There's no way a junior developer sits in front of this code and has like no idea what's going on here. If I'm seeing this code for the first time, if, I, if I'm approaching it for the very first time, and someone tells me that I should not send an email if the total amount was zero, or I should ignore exceptions, or this and that, it's perfectly simple for me. And I can write unit tests, and there's no way I can get lost in this piece of code. And there's like pretty much only one way to write it. But let's make it reactive. Let's make it reactive for the sake of having better latency, higher throughputs, resiliency, elasticity, all of these reactive manifesto buzzwords. So we'll start with this method. It takes a user and, uh, sorry, it takes a social security, where is it? Uh, it takes a name and returns a user, right? It's very simple. Uh, it seems like a pure function, but actually it's not because it has some side effect of calling another system. It can uh, add some exceptions that we didn't anticipate uh, Originally, for example, IO exceptions, socket timeout, this and that, because underneath there's actually a 
socket operation, HTTP operation, REST, whatever, database, whatever you want. So this doesn't kind of reveal the purpose, at least that's our train of thought. We want it to be more explicit, so we want to make sure that when someone reads this code, he actually knows what's going on. So rather than returning a user, pretending that it's just a simple getter, we might say return mono, or flux, or observable, or completable future, or it can be an actor which we ask and then we get a future in return using ask pattern. Doesn't matter. The bottom line is that what we get in return is some sort of a promise that tells us that we will get a user in the future. So we already see from the signature that something's asynchronously gonna happen, maybe even non-blocking. And we know that some issues may arise, for example, network issues or IO or whatever. So that was simple. And as a bonus, we get asynchronicity, so we can easily have things running concurrently. Okay, the same thing applies to contains methods. The contains method takes a social security number and returns true or false. That's very simple. It also employs database query, so we turn it into a reactive query. And I don't really mind what's the underlying implementation. It can be MongoDB, it can be Cassandra, it can be a thread pool, whatever. Just the fact that it returns some sort of a asynchronous promise. Once again, completable future, flux, observable, you name it. It's just a matter of principles. So that was simple. Then there's a simple if statement. And at this point, I actually had to think a little bit because it wasn't that obvious how to implement it. And that's one of the things. It's not that hard, but I actually had to put a, little, a few comments here because I wasn't sure how to implement it properly. There's, there are at least two other ways of implementing this particular if statement. For example, using flat map with a nested condition inside it, which already triggers a warning sign. How on earth I'm able to implement if statement in two different ways or three different ways or whatever, and it's no longer obvious. I mean, is it obvious when you're looking at it for the first time that this is an if statement, a synchronous if statement? And once again, you can implement it in multiple ways. But the fun begins. So this was the original code. And it took me like 15, maybe 20 minutes to rewrite it into a reactive style. And there are like 10 different ways of re-implementing it. So take a deep breath, because it looks more or less like this. And I was kind of surprised, and it made me really sad that I had to go through all these steps, and it's totally not obvious. I mean, you're probably trying to, to, to read through it right now. There's definitely more than one way to do it. You can use reduce operator, you can have less flat maps, you can have more flat maps, you name it which already triggers a second warning sign. How on earth such a simple piece of code can be implemented in so many different ways? And it's like three times as long. Think about a junior developer who approaches this piece of code and thinks to himself, oh my God, what am I doing? I mean, is this the, the, the life I'm going to have for, for, for the rest of my career? So this is the original code perfectly usable. Every single developer on Earth programming in every single programming language can understand it. Very few developers can understand this one. And I'm pretty sure most of you do, because you are at the React Sphere conference on the React track. So you're probably very familiar with it. And I'm pretty sure you can read it just like from top to bottom and have like absolutely no issues with it. But it will become an issue if you are a junior developer or a developer who was not doing reactive programming previously. So let's talk about ubiquitous language. This is the term that was coined by the domain-driven design guys. And they came up with the idea that, kind of obvious idea, they came up with the idea that your code should express whatever your business is doing. So QA engineers, software engineers, developers, uh, business owners, users, they should all share the same vocabulary. Basically, they should all use the same words to express the problem. This also means that your code should express the problem. Now, I read this article recently about category theory, and it says, is semi-group, monoid, mo I don't even understand half of these terms, honestly. So, are these things pervasive in your domain model when you're reading your code, and your code is about some domain? Is your domain about semi-group monoid and so on? No, most likely not. Unless your domain is category theory. If you're writing a program about category theory, most likely you will find all of these in your code base. But your code base should be shouting to you using your domain language. If you're writing a program about cars, then 
the most frequent words in your domain in your source code should be cars, drivers, engines, seats, license plates. If you're writing a program about insurances, there should be insurance class, there should be a claim, application, accident, so on and so forth. If you're writing a program about, I don't know, zoo, there will be animals. If you're writing a program about blockchain, then uh, just please stop. But the thing is, your code base should be telling the story of a business that you're trying to express. Now, if you're starting to write with Reactor, for example, then you have to ask yourself a question. Am I writing a program about infectious diseases? Mono and flux are infectious diseases in English. And if not, why every single line in my code is mono flux, mono flux, flat map, ask, future, await, then apply, and so on and so forth? This doesn't reveal the purpose. This doesn't tell you what the code is actually doing. The main requirement of the code base is that it should express your intention. It shouldn't be totally, no, sorry, uh, it should be telling you precisely what is the domain rather than expressing, rather than giving you some uh, framework details or syntax or whatever. We say so much about annotations. Annotations are evil. There was a talk yesterday about annotations that uh, XML is evil, but somehow having mono, flux, observable and all this stuff in almost every single line of code is totally fine just for the sake of being reactive. And maybe it is. Stay with me. Okay, so what's the universal measure of code quality? Can you tell me? If you would have one, one factor, what would it be? Readability, very good one. So simple, right? Simple sounds fine. I was reading this article recently. It said that Monad transformers are reducing boilerplate. If something is reducing boilerplate, it definitely increases readability, right? And maybe it's true, I don't even know what a monad transformer is, and maybe it does decrease, uh, maybe it does uh, reduce boilerplate, but it seems subjective. If you know what it is, if you know how it works, yeah, that's fine, but it seems subjective. And I, I can give you a lots of examples, like adding Lombok, which removes getters and setters, like having optionals or question mark rather than nulls. Maybe it makes the code simpler, maybe not, depends on your level of knowledge. I'm not saying this is bad, I'm just saying this is kind of subjective. So, one more try. Test it. Yeah, definitely. I love tests and all of you should love tests as well. The thing is that if you have poorly written code, you either don't have tests or you have poorly written tests. So now you have twice as much code base to support and to understand. Just the fact that you have tests and just the fact that you have 100% coverage because you wrote a smart program that calls all your getters and setters automatically doesn't mean you have well-written code base. It just means that you have the tests, someone wrote them, but they might be as unreadable and as poorly maintained as the original code base. So I'm going to give you a few more hints. So open close principle or any of the solid principles or maybe high cohesion, low coupling, or maybe cyclomatic complexity, which is measured by some clever tools. Don't repeat yourself. There are so many ways of explaining what's the meaning of good quality code. And I'm gonna give you one factor, and it's surprisingly simple. Good code is boring. When I'm reading code and someone tells me, we already been there, and someone tells me, oh, your code is so interesting, this does not mean that my code is of good quality. It just means I was clever. And if someone reading my code is clever as well, then it's interesting. But the majority would simply say, WTF, right? You don't want your code to be interesting. You don't want to be very clever. You want the code to be boring so that it expresses, it expresses the business logic as clearly as possible with no distractions, no frameworks, no methodologies, any single programmer can read it. If it's Scala, Java, Kotlin, Swift, whatever. And it's perfectly possible to write readable code in every single language, and of course, vice versa. So I want it to be transparent, and I don't want to get any frameworks get into my way. And I don't mind annotations, I don't mind Lombok, I don't mind XML, as long as I can still read the code and there is no total magic happening, and there, there are no frameworks that are only understood by 1% of the human population. All right, so you probably heard this term, 10 times developer, and it's kind of a myth that you can be, it basically means that you can be a developer that's 10 times as productive as any other developer in a team. 
rather than trying to outsmart everyone to be 10 times as productive, to have code that is 10 times as fast as any other's code. Just try to enable 10 other developers to write good code, to be able to read code and be productive as well. This will make you a much better developer, trust me. If you're writing code that no one else can understand, you're not a 10 times developer, you're an asshole developer, basically. And then you have to ask yourself a question, what are you actually optimizing? Now we're here at the reactive conference, and I love reactive programming, just in case you lost your focus. So I love pro reactive programming, honestly. But you have to ask yourself a question, what are you really trying to optimize? Now, there are a few factors for writing software, and it was an amazing uh, talk yesterday by, uh, by you and two other guys. Uh, the cost of writing software can be roughly split into actually writing the software. You have to deploy it somewhere, you have to deploy it on some hardware, unless it's serverless, because apparently it doesn't need servers, and you have to maintain it once you deploy it, uh, unless it's serverless. Okay, so how, and this is totally not based on any research, it's just my gut feeling, and I hope you can agree, or maybe we can have a chat later on. So, when you're writing blocking code, it looks more or less like this. I split it into a horizontal scale, which shows you what's the, what's the, what's the scale of the, of the software, from a tiny one to a major, like, handling millions of requests per second. And on the, on the vertical axis, you see costs in some virtual cloud coins, because I didn't do any research, so just treat it as, as a figure. Now what you can see here is that writing a simple application using blocking code is very cheap. You can just go to start.spring.io or generate, a fra or generate an application in a framework you really love, uh, have a few endpoints, they will be totally capable of handling uh, 10 or maybe 20 requests per second, deploy it on a cloud, and have it running in half an hour. And every developer can do it, and it's hardly a problem for anyone these days. The cost of writing software is minimal, because blocking frameworks are very simple. It's just a function, it takes a request, returns a response, and you do a bunch of computations. Hardware is also pretty cheap, you have to run it somewhere, unless it's serverless. And then there's maintenance, but maintenance is also pretty simple, because these, this code is simple. However, once you move further into larger scale, blocking code becomes a bottleneck. You have to spend way more time developing the software because you suddenly see bottlenecks in databases, locks, synchronized blocks, and so on and so forth. Also, the cost of hardware grows exponentially because you didn't anticipate the load. So you see that, for example, you have to scale your database horizontally because that was your choice. The maintenance is still relatively cheap because the application is written in, in a simple way. So that's, that's kind of the fact, and that's how we develop software these days. If you look at reactive code, on the other hand, it looks a little bit different. So you have to spend a significant amount of time to learn any reactive framework. And I'm talking about you know, Akka or Reactor or Vertex or whatever. And by the way, reactive programming is coming to every team and every developer very soon because after releasing of Spring Boot with Spring, Spring 5, pretty much everyone's going to be writing reactive code in, in these days. So starting with reactive project is significantly harder because basically you have to know everything in order just to start. You have to know how to compose futures, you have to know how thread pools work, you have to know how event loop works. So it doesn't matter what kind of scale are you planning for, you do have to pay for the development. You need to have significantly better developers to write reactive code. Why am I saying this? Because every developer that can write reactive code can definitely write blocking code, but not the other way around. And you can probably agree with me that reactive programming is way harder than blocking programming, especially when you're not dealing with high throughputs and, and low latencies. So development is much more costly, the servers, on the other hand, are way cheaper. The reactive code scales insanely well, especially when it's written with all the principles in mind, with non-blocking asynchronous applications. And you would be surprised how many pieces of code can be blocking, for example, equals on a URL class in Java. So you have to take all of this in mind, and then you have perfectly scalable system that utilizes CPU greatly, 
that has very low memory footprint, it's just beautiful. The maintenance can become a nightmare though. And I will give you a few examples later on. But just to give you a, a quick hint, thread pulls and threads and jumping between threads, that's a major obstacle. So that's how these two approaches uh, look like. When it comes to comparison, you see that there is a tipping point. At some point, reactive programming starts to pay off. In the beginning, because there's a much larger development cost, in the beginning you will actually pay more for a reactive system. So if you don't need it, it's just a waste of money. However, at some point you will realize that you do need reactive programming because the hardware outweighs the developers. So I would call it the Netflix point. Beyond this point, you are probably Netflix or someone similar. You do need a lot of load to handle. You do, you do need a lot of servers, you do need a lot of CPUs and so on and so forth. Reactive programming will definitely pay off. And Netflix is this kind of reactive shop that has all the microservices, reactive programming. They, they didn't invent, but they implemented RxJava. Uh, by the way, the whole concept of reactive not reactive streams, but reactive programming, uh, not reactive streams, not reactive programming, but reactive uh, extensions came from C Sharp, surprisingly. Uh, so beyond this line, you probably need reactive programming because you start to lose money. You will have to buy a lot of servers, insane amount of servers, just to support growing demand for load. But before this line, most likely it's just art. And it's fine if you're learning, it's fine if you're preparing for a different project. You just have to keep in mind that most likely you are just burning money here. Because you would be much better off just using blocking programming. So now ask yourself a question. Are you Netflix? And I'm going to give you a hint. No. Now, okay, because we are at such a conference, maybe some of you are dealing with loads that are beyond the Netflix point. Okay? And I'm pretty sure some of you do. Actually, I'm actually afraid to ask, so don't raise your hands. But when it comes to my personal experience, I'm programming for more than a decade, and only until recently I actually managed to work at a company where we have such a big load, with thousands of requests per second, where reactive programming was actually a necessity, not just my buzzword desire. Okay, let me tell you about Little's Law. It's just a single equation that you will see in, during today's presentation. Little's Law is just insanely simple but so powerful. It tells us what is the target concurrency or level of parallelism in a system that's needed to support given load. Very very simple. On the left hand side you see how many threads or how many concurrent requests you, you should expect in a system or how many cash desks in a supermarket because it's so broad. And on the right hand side you see lambda which is the average number of requests flowing to your system per second. So basically, how many requests you expect per second. And W is the average uh, time it takes to process one request. Or if it's a supermarket, how many new clients are arriving to a supermarket and how much time it takes to, 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 uh, to do a check-in of a single customer. And all the other applications. It's that simple. The, the law is so beautiful because it's not affected by any other factor. So for example, the distribution of uh, w or lambda doesn't matter at all. So let me give you a concrete example. It's actually pretty obvious once you see it. So Tomcat, very old blocking Tomcat with no fancy reactive programming whatsoever. 100 threads, this is L, this is the left hand side. 100 milliseconds per request, this is actually quite a lot. It's enough time to parse JSON, go to a database, get a response back and put it back into JSON. If your web framework, no matter which language you use, cannot handle this task in 100 milliseconds, it's garbage. And I'm pretty sure every single framework can do it. So 100 milliseconds, a reasonable response time. And this basically means 1000 requests per second. And if you think about it, it's actually obvious because it means during one second you can handle 10, connect, 10, 10 requests multiplied by 100 threads, 1000 requests per second. 1000 requests per second is actually quite a lot. And I can easily handle it with Tomcat on a laptop. Think about it. Okay, did you ever heard about space-time trade-off? So this basically means that sometimes we want to cache some things rather than make a recalculation or not, just to save on time or save on space. What about human hardware trade-off? And this is all related to our 
imaginary Netflix point. At some point in time, you want to trade hardware for people. You want to have less people or cheaper developers, cheaper developer resources, uh, because you are willing to spend more money on hardware. And that's okay. However, at some point, the roles are inverted. You want to have more expensive developers because they will still pay for less number of servers. And that's a trade-off you have to make. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a choice you have to make consciously. Okay, let's talk about maintenance. That was the third factor that we were looking at. So when talking about maintenance, I'm mostly thinking about stack traces. And I guess you know what I mean. Well, I used to hate stack traces, especially I, I, I captured this stack trace recently. You probably don't see it. It's 200 lines of stack trace in a Spring Boot application. Just to give it to you in, into perspective, this is Burj Dubai. It has 160 floors. This one is 200 lines, right? So it's pretty darn complex. That's what you tell. However, when you start working with reactive programming, you would really miss these type of stack traces because they tell you a full story, starting from servlet, through Spring, through security, through service layer, through persistence, through database, everything can be seen. It's like an open book. It's, stack traces are just awesome. And yeah, this is this is this is this is truly captured from from IntelliJ. And this is an article from Netflix. It says async by contrast is callback based. Stack trace is meaningless when trying to follow a request. This is their experience with working with various reactive programming frameworks and libraries. They also say that it's difficult to follow requests as events flow through callback, uh, as events flow. And this applies also to microservices, by the way, and reactive systems. When you have requests throwing th through multiple services, you know that at some point you lose logs in one service and you have to jump into another service. So this is the same problem, but now happening in your JVM. Uh, you do have to have some ways of figuring out how to track these uh, in your system. So that's a major pain. And IntelliJ sort of helps. It actually tries to uh, unscramble stack traces. So when you have three stack traces where one comes from the other, it, it will actually like combine them. And uh, this is a feature I can talk to you later on. So it's a pr pretty good one. And one more thing, these types of issues have proven to be quite difficult to debug. And if you've ever seen any stack trace coming from a reactive framework, and I will show you an example in just a second, uh, you can probably agree. All right, so talking about exceptions. I wrote this simple piece of code recently, and it's not about being picky into Reactor or RxJava. I wrote this really simple piece of code that basically applies three functions on top of a stream. And I got, yeah, it's foo, bar, and buzz. I will already tell you what the problem was. Some of these, one of these functions, one of these three functions, returned null. And null is forbidden in both Rx2 and, and Reactor. So you would expect null pointer exception, right? So every other Java program, Scala program, whatever, would throw a null pointer exception once you return null and null wasn't expected. And indeed, null pointer exception is thrown. And just to save you a little bit of time, there's not a single line of code in this stack trace that points to our functions. It just tells us that was null pointer exception somewhere. And that's pretty bad. And this is RxJava, this is Reactor. Many people ask me what's the difference between them. Even stack traces are the same. It's just a different package, which is a pretty weird thing. And that's the kind of issues you will find very often when doing reactive programming. Timeout exception is also my favorite. It actually jumps into my nightmares. When you're doing reactive programming, very often you'll get timeout exceptions because everything happens asynchronously, which means that sooner or later, if some action didn't happen in a specific amount of time, you will get a timeout exception. The problem is that this timeout exception will occur from some random thread that will wake up your task. This means that you will have no idea what this timeout exception actually means. This is an example from Akka. Once again, not a single line pointing to your business code because your business code was running in a different thread. It actually tells you that there was, what is it exactly, application user dollar $a. It's an anonymous actor, so you have no idea which actor did you actually ask. This comes from an ask uh, pattern in Akka, if you were writing in Akka. I have absolutely no way why this timeout occurred. 
I have absolutely no way of determining why this timeout occurred. And it also makes me really sad. It wouldn't be an issue if it was blocking code because I would have this dead long stack trace, 200 lines long stack trace, and at the very top I would get timeout exception at this particular piece of code when running this, 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 and this. It's like I don't need logs anymore because everything is there. Okay, and let's talk about monitoring for a little bit. Now, the problem with monitoring is that when you're writing reactive, uh, when you're writing blocking code, and for example, you want to measure how much time that it took for a specific piece of code to run. Uh, well, you just like put system current time millis, run a piece of code, and then see how much time that it took. Even this simple task is no longer that simple when you're doing reactive programming. Uh, first, there are queues everywhere. So I really love an architecture called staged event-driven architecture, or SEDA. This is somewhat forgotten these days, but the base, basic idea is that you have a bunch of components that are communicating with each other via queues. So you never call methods, you just send a message to a component and then component crunches the data. Uh, it's so amazing because when there's a bottleneck in your system, you immediately see where it is. You just see a queue filling in. And when there's a single queue filling in in your system, it means that either someone is overproducing data or someone is not consuming the data fast enough. And by the way, this is one of the things that reactive programming solves very, very well using back pressure. Back pressure, an amazing mechanism that wasn't visible anywhere uh, prior to reactive streams that formalized the idea. So SETA is really great and it should actually remind you of one of the architectures we already talked about quite a lot today, actors. Actors communicate with each other using queues called mailboxes. So as I already mentioned, knowing the length of the queue in these types of architectures is pretty essential for a DevOps person. Unfortunately, in Akka, the mailbox size method was removed in Akka 2 quite a few years ago, and I actually understand why they did it. It was inaccurate, Many, often, many times it was impossible. Uh, relying on a queue length was silly because people tend to uh, do things like if the queue length of my target actor exceeds something, then do not send a message. This is unreliable in distributed system. So they removed it. So at this point, there is no way of figuring out like what's the mailbox size of an actor, which is a pity, of course, unless you buy Lightband Enterprise Suite, which magically has mailbox size back. Okay, but they had their decisions, whatever. So I said a little bit about timing things. So when you're trying to time normal piece of code, I already mentioned system current time millis, run this piece of code, how much time did it took? This is the simplest way of measuring how much did it took for a reactive code with one of the flavors. This is like reactor or Java, whatever. And it's actually hard to spot what is the code that we're actually measuring? I have to start a stream with the current time, then I have to do a flat map. Inside this flat map, I'm doing the actual business logic, and then I have to remember that on success, which happens asynchronously in some other thread, I actually have to do measuring. And this is pretty, pretty hard. Okay, so let's wrap things up. You might came into conclusion that reactive programming uh, is, is not such a good idea. I'm not such influential, so I'm not worried about it. Uh, the thing is that I actually love reactive programming. I think it's, it's an amazing piece of technology, and it enabled me, just as I mentioned at the very beginning, to write some pretty darn uh, hard things, like handling hundreds of thousands of concurrent connections, millions of requests per second, scaling insanely. It's an, it's an amazingly good way of writing software when you need it. Especially in the world of microservices, where each request actually enables you or actually requires you to connect to hundreds of other services. Uh, maybe hundreds is an exaggeration, but tens, twenty, ten, twenty services. And you have to have tools to easily parallelize these requests. Otherwise, you will have very slow, very uh, very often broken system because reactive programming also means resiliency. What I'm, my, my key takeaway here is that 
you have to ask yourself a question. Are you really benefiting from reactive programming? You are benefiting personally because you learned something, uh, something which was hard and you probably feel smarter. But you have to ask yourself a question. Is in your particular system reactive programming a good choice? Or it's just over-engineering? Is it your need or is it your desire? Reactive programming should be needed in your system. It shouldn't be just uh, your particular will or the, the thing that you learn about a framework so you want to use it. It actually adds a significant amount of um, mental garbage to your code base. So if it's needed, that's fine. You just have to make a conscious decision. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have a few minutes for questions and later on, yeah, these are the slides. Uh, we still have a few minutes for questions and later on I will be uh, available on the first floor. So go ahead. Someone said totally agree. Thank you. Yes? Oh, that, was, that wasn't. Okay, so the question is why we should stop writing blockchain applications. That's like my totally personal opinion. I don't want to cover it because it's recorded. Uh, I just think it's like totally slow and wasteful way of writing databases. And that's pretty much it. Although I love the concept of blockchain as a mathematical concept. Yeah, you are first. Yeah, so there's one, and I'm actually going to try to Google it. IntelliJ async stack traces. I actually had a slide about it, and I had to remove it because I didn't have time. Uh, that's how normal developer's life look like. It's, he's just Googling frantically. So here's a, uh, it says extended debugger with stack traces, and I'm going to show it to you somewhere. There's a, there's a beautiful... Uh, there should be a beautiful... Yeah, here it is. So if you don't see it, I'm going to zoom it in a little bit. I'm actually happy to show it because in IntelliJ blog they used um, my GitHub project as an example. So you can see here that there was supply async, which is a method on completable future, supply async, and at this point you would normally lose your stack trace. At this point your stack trace would be gone, and then you would jump into another stack trace with having no context. IntelliJ, when you're doing debugging, actually figures out that this thread came from a completable future that was created in another thread. So what it does, and I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's like a very thin horizontal line. And you can see that at this point, one thread finishes, and at this point, another thread starts. So IntelliJ figured out that these two threads are correlated with each other because this thread created a completable future, and the other thread started this future. And you can see a full story. So you can see full whole thread that created future, and then you see a thread that started processing this future. So that already helps me a lot. As a matter of fact, the stack trace, this, this gigantic stack trace I was showing to you with 200 frames, it's, it was actually combined of three stack traces, of three different threads. And IntelliJ figured out that at this point I'm using Reactor, I'm doing subscribe on, on a different thread pool, so it like concatenated the stack trace of another thread, and then it concatenated a thread, uh, a, uh, a thread of yet uh, a stack of yet another thread. So there were three threads stuck on top of each other, and it was immensely helpful. And that's why it was so long. So I lied a little bit. So that's one of the efforts, basically. Yes, yes. And there are techniques. I never use it on production. For example, when you are creating a completable future or any other uh, any other mechanism, you can capture a stack trace. And then when an exception occurs in a completable future, you can restore the stack trace of a place where you create, created this, uh, this exception. I never used it, and it's, it's a bottleneck. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so it wasn't even a question, but uh, a hint. Uh, a tracing, as in open tracing or all the tracing initiatives, uh, it was meant to work across services, so you are sending something which is called a trace ID into another service and then you can track logs from different services 
uh, along the way. It also works, it has to also work across threads. So uh, you have a different thread, but you have the same trace ID and, and span ID or whatever uh, across all of these. Yes, last question. Yeah, we definitely try open tracing or tracing altogether on production and it works really well. It basically looks like a profiler in a distributed system, so we can see how much time that it took. Okay, maybe one last question. So you have to pick. Sync awaits, yeah. Okay, let, let, let me quickly answer. So the first question was, uh, investing in development time for reactive programming also means investing in a developer and making a developers better. And that's definitely an investment, which means it kind of, it still adds into a total project cost, but you do get another asset, which is a great developer, and I agree, I have nothing more to say about it. Uh, I was just comparing like the cost of the project itself, but that's a, that's a valid point. Uh, regarding the syntactic problem, of, I guess the question was, uh, is it a problem with, uh, is it a problem with, with the syntax of the, of the language that you have to write such bloated code with lots of futures, fluxes, or whatever? And yeah, maybe it is. Maybe Java is not the best language for writing reactive code. But there is the same problem with Scala. You still have four comprehensions that are combining futures. There's still an issue with that. JavaScript came a long way with async await, which kind of helps a lot. I hope that in the future we'll have a language where reactive is going to be embedded into a syntax. So every time I write A plus B, it actually means a composition of futures. Just like in Excel spreadsheet where you write A1 plus B1, it actually is, it's actually a graph of components that are propagating the change. And you don't think that you don't think in terms of functional reactive programming when you're doing an Excel spreadsheet. So thank you very much once again, and I'm going to say thank you.